Okay, so let's get started instead of me waffling on and on and on. Um, I want to do this question first and then, oh, that's lovely, Kamakhelo. So explains everything and allows you to do the question while guiding you. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That's exactly what you need. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad. It's lovely to have that positive feedback from you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to start this evening by doing a question where we're going to pull everything together. So right back from the very beginning, um, when we were, well, not very beginning, but halfway through this course, when we were spoke, speaking about factorizing cubic expressions, solving cubic equations. Okay, we don't have to sketch now. Um, calculating the coordinates at the turning points, calculating the coordinates at the point of inflection, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is now being pulled together because this is what you're going to be presented with, right? We've done all these things separately when we really get asked the questions and tests and exams, one thing leads into the next. All right, so we've got to be able to use all these skills and concepts in one question. All right, so the first thing that they want us to do, let's just read the information. It says the graph of f of x equals ax cubed plus bx squared plus 24x minus 20 is sketched alongside not to scale. Fine. A, 2 and 0 is a local maximum turning point. B is the y-intercept. C is the other x-intercept of this particular function and uh, D is a local minimum turning point and E is the point of inflection. So first things first, they want us to determine the values of A and B. All right, so how do you think we're going to work out A and B? What do you guys reckon we're going to do in this situation? How are we going to work out A and B matrix? What, what do you guys think we should do here? Tim, I know you guys were very quiet the last time. If you don't want to talk, then just put it on the, on the chat. Get the other value for the turning point. Okay, but now they do want us to do that, but they want us to do that down here. OK, so that means that we don't need to know the value of the other turning point in order to be able to answer this question. Because remember, we've got to work from top to bottom. We can't go and answer questions at the bottom first and then work backwards. All right, because we're going to get penalized for that. So think back to our lesson on Tuesday. All right, I showed you a couple of things. First of all, let's just see what's going on in the chat. The derivative, okay, lovely. All right, so the first derivative, the second derivative, which derivative? Zadalia, what do you think? Hi, ma'am. I'm fine. I'm fine, and you? I'm good, thanks. Good. I'm, not sure I'm, I'm not sure if I'm completely correct, but to substitute the point A, which mm -hmm. is to go into the equation, but mm -hmm. into the, would you do it into the first derivative or the original equation? You would do it into both. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. okay. So you would do it, you would do it into both. Okay. okay. So, and no problem. So well done. That's really great. I'm glad that you said that. Okay. So into the first derivative, the first derivative is f prime x equals 3ax squared plus 2bx plus 24. Okay. So we're going to sub this point in. The gradient at this point is zero, not the y coordinate. I mean, the y coordinate is zero as well, but this is a turning point. So when I write zero over here, it is because the gradient at the turning point is zero. The x coordinate at the turning point is two. So I'm going to sub in two where x should go. And we will get one of our equations. So zero would be equal to. 12a plus 4b uh, plus 24. And if I bring that over to the other side, I'd get negative 24 equals 12a plus 4b. And that would be our first equation. Okay, as Zedalia said, we are also going to sub the coordinates 2 and 0 into the original equation. So we're treating 2 and 0 as x and y coordinates. Okay, so subbing those in we would get zero equals 
a times two cubed plus b times two squared plus 24 times two minus 20. And again, we just want to multiply things out. So this would give us 8a plus 4b plus 48 minus 20. So if I bring that over to the other side, it would be plus 28 on this side. So it's going to be minus 28 on this side plus 4b. And that matrix is equation number two. Okay, so now we need to solve those simultaneously. All right, now whether you want to do it by substitution or whether you want to do it by elimination, the choice is yours. Okay, what do you want me to do? The first person in the chat, that's the method I'm doing. If you want me to show you the other one, I can. First person in the chat, elimination or substitution? What do we sub? Okay. <laughs> to be so you were quick. All right. I tell you what, what I'll do in this case is I'll show you both, right? Because personally, I prefer elimination, but it's not about me. It's about you. Um, I just think it's so much faster, but not a problem. If you want to do the elimination method, you can take either one of these two equations and choose to make something the subject. So what I would do is I'd probably make B the subject. I would divide through by four. So I'd take my minus 24 equals 12A plus 4B and divide each term by four. That'll give you negative six equals 3A plus B and making B the subject of the formula, B would be equal to negative six minus 3A. You've now got to sub that into the second equation. Okay, so minus 28 equals 8a plus 4 times negative 6 minus 3a. So removing your brackets, you'd end up with minus 24 minus 12a. All right, let's just go down a little bit. Add 24 to both sides. This would give us negative 4. And 8a minus 12a would give us negative 4a. So a would be equal to 1. Subbing back in for b into this equation over here, b would be equal to minus 6 minus 3 times 1. So that means that b is equal to negative 9. Okay, so that's by substitution. If you want to use elimination, sorry, this is just a question for later. Let me just move it over. Oopsie daisy, too much. If you want to use elimination, there it is. Okay, um, elimination. All right, so when you eliminate, yes, Kamahelo. Hi, ma'am. Hi. You good? I'm fine. How are you? I'm all right. I would like to Good. explain the elimination one. Good. Oh, lovely. I'm so glad. I get so sick and tired of listening to my own voice. So cool. Go for it. I've written the two equations there. Tell me what to do. So since we have positive 4B and positive 4B on both equations, we're going to um, um, multiply the second equation with the negative. Okay. All right, and you then can do that, get, that's fine. And then, and then you get, get um, positive 28 is equals to negative 8a minus 4b, and then the negative 4b and the 4b cancel out each other. All right, you've got the right idea here. So what you would actually do, well done, that's exactly it. But what you can do is this, all right? Subtract the equations and work in columns. And then you can eliminate your like terms like this. So in other words, what you do is you say minus 24 minus negative 28. That would give you 4. 12a minus 8a would give you 4a. 14. And then 4b minus 4b, now you've eliminated it. Okay, yes, so you can, you can sometimes multiply through by negative, but in this case, you don't even need to do that. You can just subtract the one equation from the other. Okay, and Bob's your uncle, A is equal to one as well. Of course, you have to get B by substituting back substituting, in. Substituting, yes. yes. Okay, <laughs> well done. Kamohelo, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've got 12 times one, 
plus 4b, so that means that 4b would be equal to negative 36, divide both sides by 4, and b would be equal to negative 9. Okay, so there you go. You can either do it by substitution if you want to, or you can do it by good old elimination. I also prefer the elimination method, but the choice is yours. Okay, so now we know what A and B are. All right, so we'll just write it here for ourselves. We know that A is equal to one and B is equal to negative nine. Okay, so we've worked out the values of A and B. I should also like to say at this point that in exams and test questions, they generally don't ask this question by saying determine the values of A and B. The reason for that is because if you cannot work out what A and B are, you can't do the rest of the questions, right? You can still do question B in this case, but you wouldn't be able to do C, D, or E. So this question will look most likely like this. They will say, show that A equals 1 and B equals negative 9. Okay, that's how it'll probably be phrased. All right, so you see when they've got a question like this and it says show that A is 1 and B is negative 9, they are asking you to find the equation of the cubic function. In this case, just the value of the A and the B. Okay, are there any other questions or can I go on to B? Are we all good? Katlejo, I see you've got a hand up. Go for it. Hi, ma'am. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, Hi, Katlejo. Uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, mm. but I'm kind of lost why you did what you did in the very beginning. So maybe if you just re-explain why you did what you did, ma'am. With the first derivative, what's that the original equation in the first derivative, ma'am? Okay. All right. So the first derivative is the one in green. The original equation is the one in blue. Okay, so in this case, they gave us the coordinates at a turning point on the function. And they wanted us to work out the values of A and B. So when they give us the coordinates at the turning point, we have to use the first derivative because the first derivative at the, the gradient at the turning point is going to be equal to zero. So that's how we are able to sub in the x value at the turning point and then equate it to zero, which is what I was doing in this line over here. That gives us one equation in terms of a and b. The one in blue is where you are subbing the point that they've given you into the original equation into f of x. And that gives you a different equation also in terms of a and b. And then those are the two that you solve simultaneously. Does that make more sense? Oh, yes, ma'am. I was really lost because I thought that like the turning point, you use the second derivative. So now it makes no. sense, ma'am. No, 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 no problem. You don't use the second derivative for turning points. You use the first derivative for turning points because the gradient at the turning point is zero. Okay, so for gradient, you've got to use the first derivative. You use the second derivative for concavity. Okay, so I'll just write that up here again. Okay, the first derivative is for gradient. Your second derivative is your point of inflection, or it's all about concavity. Okay, oh, I'll come on, sleep in. Okay, let's just get rid of all of that. Gumph that's come up on the screen now. Okay, so if they ask you for the point of inflection, you can use the second derivative. Okay, but I'm going to do it in two ways with you this evening, um, just to remind you. Okay, <clears throat> now on to the coordinates of B. Remember they told us in the beginning here, B is the y-intercept. What are the coordinates at B? They've actually been given to us if we know where to look. What are the coordinates at B? Good, Zedalia. All right, so the coordinates at B are 0 and negative 20. Okay, so this value over here, the constant, that's your y-intercept. Excellent. Next question, the length of AC. So 
we know what this question is asking for us. They want to know the length of AC, but what do we need in order to be able to calculate the length of AC? So what's implied by the question? What's implied here? It's not explicitly asked for, but it's implied that we need to calculate it. Exactly, the other x-intercept, the x-intercept at C. Now, again, there are two ways in which we can answer this question. There's one way that's a little bit shorter, and there's another way that's a little bit longer, which is probably the one that is more familiar to you. Okay, so I'm going to do it the slightly longer way. And then if you want me to show the show you the other way, then I'm more than happy to do that as well. Okay, so <clears throat> in order to uh, calculate the coordinates at C, we need the equation. So the equation is f of x equals, remember we calculated a as 1, and b was negative 9, and it was plus 24x minus 20, if my memory serves me correctly, yes. Okay, so in order to calculate the coordinates at C, it's very helpful when we factorize or solve cubic equations, if we have a linear factor of our cubic. Do we have a linear factor? Do we have a linear factor, Matrix? So think about factor theorem. It was like our fourth lesson. Do we have a linear factor for f of x? Yes, we do. Katlejo, so daily. Is that more meaning what goes into the bracket when you say minus two? I think that's what you mean. Yes, okay, cool. Because we know that when two goes in, we get zero out, don't we? Okay, so if two goes in and we get zero out, we know that x minus two has to be a factor, right? For the x-intercept, the other thing that's important is that y has to be equal to zero, doesn't it? Okay, so we know that x minus two is a linear factor, and now we can either use the method of synthetic division, or we can use inspection in order to be able to work out the A, the B, and the C. Okay, so does this ring a bell? We spent quite a lot of time talking about this when we were factorizing cubic equations, sorry, factorizing cubic expressions and solving cubic equations. All right, so by inspection, we can see that when we multiply first with first, we would get ax cubed, and we know that it's equal to 1x cubed because we solved that. So that means that a is equal to 1. When we want to work out our c value, if you remember, we take the negative 2, we multiply it by c, and we make it equal to the negative 20. So c is equal to 10. Good, Katleho, well done. Now we've got to work out b. Can you guys tell me what B is? Did me doing it, can anybody tell me what B would be? What B would be? You see how all these previous skills are now coming into play. We've got to be able to do all the things that we learned about. Can anybody tell me how to work out B? Do you remember? You guys are so quiet. Can no one remember how to work out B? Um, Shania, that's the right answer. Okay, oh, Zedalia, you've got here negative seven X. Yes, correct. Okay, so let's just talk about how we would do that. Do you remember I showed you how to multiply X with BX? and minus two with ax squared, because they both give us x squared terms. So this gives us bx squared 
and then a was equal to 1, so this is minus 2x squared, and we can see that it's equal to negative 9x squared in our equation. So we would say that b minus 2 is negative 9. So, oh, that was just your, your tiny little mistake. Now I understand why you said minus 11, Katlejo. Okay, you remember you've got to add 2 to both sides. Okay, so it was just a little mistake. Okay, but that's really nice. Katlejo, you used positive 2. Okay, if positive 2, do you mean positive 2 in your bracket? Uh, Ma'am, instead of saying minus 2 multiply um, a x squared, ma'am, I said positive 2, ma'am. I think uh, I was looking at... Okay, all right, I understand now. Okay, all right, there we go. So fixed up, that means we've got 0 equals x minus 2 multiplied by 1x squared minus 7x plus 10. All right, <clears throat> now I want to ask you a question before I go ahead and factorize, okay? What are you expecting to happen when you factorize? There's, there's a very specific result that we know that we're going to get in this situation. Does anybody know what I'm getting at? I don't know if you, if you remember us discussing this. It's a very specific result that I'm expecting in my answer over here. Can anybody... Yes, yeah, so to co correct Zedalia, what does one of the solutions have to be? Not fractions in this case, Katlejo. There's a very specific ex uh, answer I'm expecting. No cubes. No cubes. So what I'm getting at, guys, is that when your cubic has its turning point on the x-axis, correct, Trish, that's part of the answer. Yes, that's right. Okay, so when you factorize over here, matrix, Look at what happens. When you factorize x squared minus 7x plus 10, you get another bracket with x minus 2 in it. The other bracket would be x minus 5. So the specific result that I am referring to is that this bracket over here is repeated. Okay, because this point is a turning point and an x-intercept. Okay, so you can use that as a way of checking that you are on the right track. Okay, so because in this case, there can only be two x intercepts. There's not three x intercepts, there's only two. So we know that the one is two, but that's not the one that we're after, is it? Okay, or x is going to be equal to five. Okay, as somebody did say in the chat. So therefore, at C, we would say that x was equal to 5. That means that the length of AC, it's a horizontal line. So it's the x to the right minus the x to the left. So this is going to be 5 minus 2, which gives us 3 units. OK. X is 5. Yes, Adelia is one arca, ma'am. How did you get bx squared minus? OK. so. Zwanaka, if you look on the left-hand side where I have written the line in purple, this line over here where I'm drawing the arrow now, you have to multiply the x in the first bracket with the bx to get the bx squared and the minus 2 with the ax squared to get minus 2x squared and then you make it equal to the x squared term in the equation. Okay, so this method is... Um, it's called inspection, right? You can also use synthetic division if you want. All right, now you don't have to use um, distance formula. Distance formula matrix is when you want to calculate the length of a diagonal line. Okay, so when you're working out the length of a horizontal line, it's the x to the right minus the x to the left. Just like when you work out the length of a vertical line, it's the y at the top minus the y at the bottom. So you don't need, even though it uses the word length, you do not need distance formula. 
Okay, so think about it like this. If you're standing at A, you're on two. If you're standing at C, you're on five. So all you need to do is walk three steps forward to get from A to C. That's all they want from you. Okay. All right, are there any other questions? Okay. All right, no problem, Kamakhelo. So <clears throat> when you are doing, yes, Zedalia. Sorry, ma'am, I just wanted to ask, um, the equation that I put in the chat, is that what you were speaking about when you said that the X minus two is repeated? That's it. That's it. Is it That's okay. exactly Thank yes, you, absolutely. That's, That's absolutely, absolutely correct. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. Thank you, ma'am. No problem. And in fact, Zedalia, the second method of being able to do this question involves what you were just talking about now, which is something else that I wanted to show you guys this evening. In fact, I tell you what, Kamakhelo, let me do that. And then I will do the synthetic division for you as well. Okay. So the other way that you can calculate the length of AC, so in other words, calculating the the x coordinate at c is to do this all right you know that your um equation when one of your x coordinates is also a turning point you can use x minus x1 oh sorry beg your pardon i left the a out hold on a second let's just go back and put that in so y equals a x minus x1 x minus x2, and that has to be squared. Do you remember we were talking about this on Tuesday? All right, so we've got more information now. We also know that the coordinates at B are 0 and negative 20, and we're going to need that if we want to do it this way. All right, remember the bracket that's squared is the, the turning point in the x-intercept. So you've got y equals a x minus x1, x1 is your x coordinate at c. Okay, so x1 is the x coordinate at c, or we could call it xc if we wanted to. And then over here, we've got uh, x minus 2 squared. We already know that a is equal to 1. We've, we've calculated that all the way back here. So we can fill in what our a value is, we know that it's 1. Now we want to sub in our other point. So we've got negative 20, our y-intercept is equal to 1. x was 0 when y was 20. So we've got 0 minus x1, 0 minus 2, which now needs to be squared. So negative 20 will be equal to, remember when we multiply 1 by something, it's not going to change. So from my first bracket, I have got negative x1. I now need to multiply that by the value of the second bracket. So, so negative 2 squared is going to leave me with 4. So the coefficient of x1 is negative 4. Divide both sides by negative 4, and the x coordinate at c is going to be equal to 5. OK, so that would be the alternative way of being able to answer this question. Okay, everybody happy with that? Does that make sense? Are there any questions? Kamakhelo. Um, Ma'am, you see yes. under question, they said that we should calculate the length of AC. Yes. And then um, on the first equation, on your... Um, inspection method you said that ac is equal to five minus two is equal to three units are we still yes. going to calculate the other x okay so you don't need to calculate the other x because you know that it's two. Oh, okay ma'am okay all right so if you remember this question wanted the length of ac so this is just a, an alternative method of being able to work out the x coordinate at c 
Right, okay, so you know that at C, no problem, the coordinates are five and zero. And then when they wanted AC from you, you would still just do that and you would end up with three. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does, ma'am. Okay, all right. So it's just an alternative way of being able to work out what the um, X coordinate at C is. You would still obviously have to say five minus two in order to be able to get the answer for the actual question. Okay, I see there are a couple of hands ups Let me, or, or comments here. Let's just have a quick look at those. Let's stick to the first one, that's fine. It's up to you, okay? It really is your choice, okay? What you want to do. Okay, now the coordinates of D, that was the next question, all right? So let's just go back and have a look at the diagram. What does D represent? What does D represent? What have they told us point D is? Okay, it's our local minimum. It is a turning point. So you know that the gradient at the turning point is, the gradient at the turning point is zero, good. All right, so remember, when we are working with gradient, we've got to use the first derivative. Okay, so in order to be able to answer question D, we have to use the first derivative, the gradient at the turning point is zero. Okay, let's just clear some space here. Okay, so you need to derive. So taking our first derivative, we would end up with 3x squared minus 18x plus 24. When they ask you to calculate the coordinates at the turning points matrix, it's very important that you show what I'm about to say to you, okay? Um, a lot of matrix end up losing marks unnecessarily and each mark that you lose eventually adds up to quite a lot of marks on things that are essentially called silly mistakes. You have to show that the gradient at the turning point is zero. You must write this zero. You cannot solve for the x's unless it's equal to zero. Okay, so you must show that it equals zero and then go ahead and go and solve. At this point now, if your factorizing is iffy, you can use the quadratic formula show that you have subbed into the quadratic formula, okay? Because that mark that you're gonna get for the quadratic formula is the same mark that you get on your factors line. Okay, exactly, Zedalia, okay. And then we would choose four and not two. Okay, so Zedalia has gone ahead. We can divide through by three here. And as you said, Zedalia, your factors, are that and your answers are two or four and again this is what you were expecting you were expecting an answer of two you know that that's one of the turning points all right it's already given to you so x equals four so at d x must be equal to four right again this is also a very important line you must make sure that your factors are equal to zero Okay, there's often an accuracy mark given on that line. A lot of matrix end up losing it because they just factorize the trinomial and they don't write equals zero. Okay, so the factors must equal zero. Remember, factors are marked the whole way through caps, not just in a specific question like they are in IEB. All right, now in order to calculate the Y coordinate, it's very easy. Kamachelo. Ma'am, if I cannot get the factors there, can I use quadratic? Yes, absolutely. All right, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. So no problem. So your alternative here would, I would just do it at this point over there. So I would say X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus four A C 
all over 2a. Okay, and then you would find exactly the same thing. Either x would be equal to 2 or x would be equal to 4. All right, so the line that I have highlighted in yellow replaces this. Okay, the mark in the exam would be the same thing. Okay, your factors must equal zero though. All right, and you've got to have this zero over there. Okay, so the original equation was, yeah, sorry, it's gone off the screen now, was over here in blue. So it's x cubed minus 9x squared plus 24x minus 20. Okay, so we would need to go and sub 4 in here. So this would be, let's just get the right pen. So that would be 4 cubed minus 9 times 4 squared plus 24 times 4 minus 20. What are you guys getting as an answer? I'm also getting negative four. Okay, and when they ask you for coordinates matrix, make sure that you write your answer as coordinates. Okay, because sometimes they give you marks on that. Sometimes they're lenient and they let it slide if you just work out an X and a Y and then other times they're pedantic about it. So if they ask for coordinates, write the coordinates and then no one can penalize you for anything. Right, and again, our answers make sense with what it is that we see. We see that D is a point in the fourth quadrant and we get a positive X and a negative Y. So we're feeling confident that we've got the right answers. Okay, all right. So that was question D. So we've done question C, we've done question D. It's just question E that we still need to do. All right, so the coordinates of E, recall here, they told us that E was the point of inflection. Okay, so when you want to calculate the coordinates at the point of inflection matrix, there are two ways in which you can answer that question. Can anybody tell me what they are? What are the two ways we can do that? Second derivative, good. Well done, Trish and Shasana. What's the other way? At certain body. Okay, good stuff. All right, so either or. Okay, second derivative. So here's question E. So our second derivative comes from deriving our first derivative again. So I can see our first derivative over here in green. So this gives us 6x squared. Oh, sorry, not 6x squared. Beg your pardon, 6x minus 18. Okay, again, just like you have to show that um, the gradient at the turning point is zero when you're working with the first derivative, you have to show that the measure of concavity at the point of inflection is zero as well. You cannot solve for x without the zero here. There's marks for it as well. Okay, so that means that 6x would be equal to 18. So x would be equal to 3. That would be one way of doing it. The other way, like in Bali said, midpoint formula. So the x coordinate at E, the um, point of inflection is always midway between your turning points. So the one turning point was at 2, the other one was at 4. Remember, we calculated the coordinates of D and we would divide that by 2. Okay, so that would give us 6 over 2, which would give us 3. Okay, are there any questions, Matrix? Don't forget to take screenshots if you need to. Anything you want to ask before we go on and look at the next question? Okay, so Nicole, you happy? How's everybody else feeling? Good stuff. Cool. All right. Okay. 
All right, so we've got 20 minutes. Let's see if we can squash in a slightly more difficult question. All right, so I want to do this one with you. Um, let me just see if I can scooch more over to the side here. What? Okay. So the reason that I want to do this question is because it's got some slightly more difficult questions to the end that involve um, inequalities, all right? So this is also a more sort of typical exam type question, all right? So they've told us the graph of the function f of x equals ax cubed plus bx plus c has a turning point at minus one and cuts the y-axis at minus two show that a equals one, b equals minus three, and c equals minus two. These are the, this is more the way in which they would phrase a question like that. Okay, so, oh, hang on a second. Sorry, I'm just looking in there. Didn't you know that you could use midpoint? Okay, well then, Keith Lynn, that's nice for you. You've learned something new this evening. Okay, so yes, um, as an alternative for the second derivative, your point of inflection will always be midway between your two turning points. Okay, so that will also work as well. All right, what I'm going to do, because we're kind of running out of time, question A is very similar to what we've just done. Okay, so I'm not going to work through that again. All right, you guys can always come back and try and do this yourselves, but we... Well, theoretically, we know how to do that. Okay, so in this question, we've got f of x, and we know that f of x is equal to 1x cubed minus 3x uh, minus 2. Okay. Um, calculate the coordinates of the minimum turning point A. We know how to do that as well. We've just spoken about that. So we would take the first derivative, make it equal to zero, and then go and solve. Now we might need that answer in uh, these questions. So let's just do that very quickly. So for part B, we're going to take our first derivative. That would give us 3x squared minus three. So we have to make that equal to zero. Um, we can divide through by three. We end up with x squared minus one. And then when we factorize our difference of two squares, we would have either x is equal to negative one, which it isn't at a, or x is equal to positive one. So at a, x is equal to positive one. Um, when we want to work out the coordinates of a, so the y coordinate, we would say that y was equal to one cubed minus three times one minus two, which leaves us with one minus three, so that would be negative four. Okay, so at a, the coordinates are one and negative four. Um, sorry, the other x coordinate at B let's just work that out quickly as well. Maybe you guys can do that. Maybe I should stop talking. You guys work out the x intercept at B and you tell me what you get. Hugo, I'm just going to two seconds. I just want to grab something quickly. I'll be right back. No problem. Okay, guys, if there's anything that's maybe hindering you to continue, if you have any questions or stuck at any point, please let me know. I won't mind helping you. Let me know in the chat.
Okay, I'm back. It's so difficult trying to see what's going on here in the dark. Anybody got the coordinates for B yet? Ma'am? Mm. I just wanted to ask if I'm on the correct track with my equation. Because mm -hmm. I got um, in the first bracket X plus one. Sure. And then in my second bracket, x squared minus 4x minus 2. Mm, something's gone wrong there. Yeah, I also think okay. so. Okay. All right. So something's gone wrong. So what we should have is, let's just see if we can find your, well, help you find your mistake, right? So your first bracket you said was x plus one, which is correct. We know that this is equal to one over here. So this would have to be x squared um, plus bx plus c. So one times c would be one c. So that would be negative two. So that's correct. Then as far as your bx squared term is concerned, you'd have bx squared plus 1x squared equals 0x squared, because there's no, there's no x squared term in here. Let me just check that I've done that correctly. So that would be b plus 1 equals 0. So b would be equal to negative 1. Oh, okay, see. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, no problem. So you've got x squared minus x, and then over here you had minus 2. That's what you should have. Okay. Um, Mulebo, why did we choose positive 1, but point A is... Okay, so Mulebo, I don't know if you've joined our course sort of later on. This is something that we discussed right back at the beginning when we did factor theorem. Okay, so your bracket, inside the bracket, it has to change sign. Okay, because remember, when you're writing x plus 1 equals 0, in order for it to be negative 1, when you solve it, it would have to have the opposite sign inside the bracket. Okay, and then again here, you're expecting, so one bracket would be plus 1, the other bracket would be minus two. So again, can you see you've got that doubling up of the brackets when you've got a turning point on the x-axis. So either x would be equal to negative one or x would be equal to two. So at b, x is equal to two. Uh, so your coordinates at b would be two and zero. Good. Yes. Well done. Yes, Kamakhelo. Um, Ma'am, with this one, can we still use the equation of y is equal to a into x minus x1 into x, x minus x2 squared? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, yep. and what would... What would our um, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm just, I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes. Can you still? Let me just check that quickly before I say yes. Can you use y equals a x minus x one, x minus x two squared? Let's just check. You've got y equals a, which we already know is one, yes. um, x minus the x at B, and then here you've got x plus 1 squared. We also know the coordinates of the y-intercept, so we could use that. So we could say negative 2 equals, we know that that's 1, 0 minus xb 
yes, it's, it will work. All right, thank you, ma'am. Not a problem. Okay, yes, I've kind of stopped halfway, but sure, that's not a problem. Okay. All right, so, oh, shame, guys. I'm sorry, I was rushing you, and I just wanted to be able to show you these questions down here at the bottom. The coordinates at the point of inflection, we know that as well. We'll just see how far we can get. So we know, let's just use midpoint formula because it's easier. So X would be equal to minus one um, plus one over two. So that would be equal to zero. So actually what we've discovered is that in this particular case, our Y intercept is also our point of inflection. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? I hope I haven't lost you. I know I've kind of rushed a little bit here. Are we all okay? All right. Okay, so the reason I rushed is because I really want to do question E, F and G with you if we've got time, all right? So, Looking at question E, it says, for which values of X will F double prime X be greater than zero? What are they asking you about, Matrix? What are they asking you about F double prime X? What do they, what do they mean by this? Does anybody, can anybody tell me what does F prime prime X greater than zero. What does this mean? Zedalia? Ma'am, they're asking where the graph of the second derivative is bigger than zero. Sure, sure, absolutely. That's one way of being able to look at it. Cool. Trish, that's another way of being able to look at it. All right, so they are saying to you for which values of X is the graph concave up? Remember, if F prime prime X is greater than zero, that is concave up. If F prime prime X is smaller than zero, that is when it is concave down. Okay, so in other words, they are asking you, where does the graph change from being concave down to being concave up? We've just calculated that, all right, at zero. Okay, so in this case, our point of inflection is where X is equal to zero. So the answer to this will be when X is greater than zero. Okay, the graph will be concave up. Okay. Oh, let's try and finish this. Question F. Write down the values of X for which F prime X is greater than zero. What does F prime X greater than zero mean? What does this mean? That's it, well done, Zedalia. Okay, where is the graph increasing? Where is the gradient? Positive. Okay, so either the values of X for which it is increasing or we have a positive gradient. Okay, so now remember the gradient changes at the turning points. So the graph is going to be increasing over here. Wow, what a horrible line and over there. Okay, between the turning points, it's decreasing. Right, so this is going to be either where X is smaller than negative one, or where X is greater than one. Okay, remember at one, at A, sorry, the coordinates were one and negative four. So when X is a number that's smaller than negative one, the graph is increasing. When X is a number that's bigger than one, the graph is increasing again. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, Ma'am? Mm. Could you please repeat that again? 
sure, okay? So when they ask you uh, for which values of x is f prime x greater than zero, f prime x greater than zero means that the gradient, remember the gradient is the first derivative, is greater than zero is positive. So remember, we need to think about where are we walking uphill, always as x gets bigger. Okay, so you are walking uphill at the parts that I've highlighted in yellow. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so in other words, from negative infinity up to minus one, you're walking uphill. So that's where x is smaller than minus one comes in. You're walking uphill again, where x was equal to one to the right. So from one to positive infinity, that's where the x is greater than one comes in. All right, ma'am. Thank you, Essie. Okay. All right. So uh, increasing gradient, positive gradient is where are you walking uphill from left to right? Okay. You can also write that using um, interval notation if you want to, but I think we're running out of time. Now, this last question is a little bit more difficult to understand. When they say for which values of, <coughs> I think that was supposed to be an X, not a K. For which values of X, for which F of X equals K only has one root. Okay, no, I think it actually was supposed to be a K. All right, so what does F of X equal K mean? Does anybody know what F of X equals K means? What does K mm -hmm. represent? Kamakhelo? Um, Ma'am, I'm not quite sure, but I think it means that the Y value the y intercept or the y value of f at x is equal to k. You are on the right track. You're on the right track. So f of x equals k, all right, is a horizontal, k is a horizontal line. Okay, so f of x is our cubic function and k, the line y equals k is a horizontal line. Okay, so you've got a horizontal line that can shift up or down. And where it cuts the y-axis is going to be your k value. Now they've said it's only allowed to have one root. So that means that this horizontal line can only touch the cubic function once. If I let it go over there, how many times is it touching the cubic function? How many times is it touching the cubic function if I let it go where it is? three times, brilliant, excellent. If I move it up so that it's sitting there at the turning point, how many times is the horizontal line touching the cubic function now? Ugh, cold coffee. Twice, absolutely. So in its first position, there were three roots. In its position now, there are two roots. What happens if I move this horizontal line a little bit further up? How many times is it cutting the cubic function now? How many times is it touching the cubic function now? Just once, excellent. Okay, so provided this straight line is above your turning point. It will only cut the cubic function in one place. So that means that your K value has to be bigger than zero, one of them. K has to be bigger than zero. The other side of this is if I put it at the turning point at the bottom. Remember at this turning point, all right, this would be negative four, your y value. So this straight line would be the y line minus four. So here, or k would need to be a number that is smaller than negative four. Okay. So there's two values for k that satisfy this particular question. K either needs to be bigger than zero or smaller than negative four. Yes, Sedalia. 
Hi, ma'am. I'm sorry, oh, but I just want okay. to mm. where, where the, you have your pink line, the, mm. the K that's busy moving. Yes. Isn't it twice still? Because it's at A and then also there on the if side. You, very good question, Zedalia. So if it is bigger than zero, it's not equal to zero. If you oh, say smaller than minus four, it's not equal to minus four. So as long as it's bigger than zero, but not zero, or smaller than minus four, but not minus four, there's only going to be one root. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I'm sorry I rushed that little bit at the end. I just wanted to do a bit of extension work with you guys. I hope that this has made sense. Any other questions? Excuse me, any other questions? Let's see here. Katle, go for it. Ma'am, I wanted to know what if you say y is bigger than um, zero and y is smaller than negative? For me, would it be wrong? Because I'm, basically we're working with the y-axis. Yes. So in other words, no, yeah. But in this case, what they have done is that they've given it a letter. So they would expect you to use that letter. Maybe what you would find is that if this was a class test or a control test, your teacher might be lenient. And if you got both values correct with the correct inequality sign, maybe they'd give you like one mark. But in an exam, they would expect you to use the correct letter, which is K. Okay, Katleho. Okay, then thank you so much, man. All right. So no problem. To be so, how do you know? Okay. You know because if you've seen this before, Y equals K, that is the equation of a horizontal line. Okay, think about um, a horizontal asymptote. It's always in the form y equals a constant. So k represents a constant, a y value. Okay, remember if a line is in the form x equals a, a number, let's say x equals one, then that is a vertical line. Okay, Kamuchero? Ma'am? Mm. Um. I normally have a problem whereby they say, could you please scroll down a bit? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say um, K has only one root, right? Mm. Sometimes they say like it has three roots or something. Mm. Mm. Can you please go up on the graph mm. again? <laughs> mm. Mm. No problem. It means that um, we're going to put our horizontal line in the middle and it's going to touch the graph at one, two, three points, right? Correct. So my problem is that you see now that the, 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 the horizontal line at the top. Yes. How many times is it touching the graph? Okay, that's the x-axis. Okay, so the black line that's here on the diagram this is the x-axis all right yes. so it is so the x-axis is touching this graph twice once at the turning point and once at b oh okay does that make sense to you because it's a tangent yes. the x-axis is acting as a tangent to the function at its x-intercept Oh, that I always get this wrong. I'd be like, it's touching the graph twice. And I'm like, yeah. how do I get the one root? Yeah, yeah. So for one root, for one root on a cubic function, your, your straight line has to be above or below your turning points. For two distinct roots, it has to be at the turning points. And for three distinct roots, it has to be between the turning points. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, ma'am. Okay, 